body of born again baptized believers in Jesus Christ, the church, we have a tendency to associate the likeness of Jesus Christ's humanity with our own likeness. Thus, we halter or we limit Jesus Christ. Amen. Starting in verse 1, Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. I'm going to read six verses, I'll pray, and we'll get into the message. In chapter 6 of Mark, in verse 1, And he went out from thence, and came into his own country, and his disciples followed, or excuse me, followed him. I just think that's interesting. Yeah. Follow him. There's two, two different tenses here. Yeah. His disciples, if we were to read it correctly, the and I believe this is correctly the way that God wants it. Don't misunderstand him. But what I'm saying is his disciples follow him. If we were to read this in some novel, it would say followed him. I'm not correcting the text. There's an absolute understandable reason why it says follow him. And I'll get to Amen. that. And his disciples followed him. And when, verse 2, and when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter's son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. And Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. Verse 5. Notice this. Let this sink in. And he could there do no mighty works. Just for emphasis sake, let me read it again. And he could there do no mighty works. Doesn't say he wasn't willing. Doesn't say he didn't want to. It says he could there do no mighty works. Save that he laid his hand upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went round about the villages teaching. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much. Lord Jesus, we humbly come before your throne of grace, before your throne of mercy, before the throne that pours out all blessings. And we just ask that you would do that here tonight. That you would take this simple yet interesting portion of Scripture, God-breathed, divinely inspired portion of Scripture and allow it to be used to encourage and strengthen and guide and motivate and challenge each one of us here this evening as we move forward into the new year. We thank you for what you'll do. We praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As my wife and I spent... Nearly two years on deputation, we got the privilege to visit many churches in many states. And what I'm about to tell you, I can't speak for every state, but hands down, every single state we went into had someone famous that had come out of that state. For instance, if you travel up through Texarkana into Arkansas, you're going to run by a sign that says, Home of President Bill Clinton. If you travel across Arkansas, as you enter into the great city of Memphis, Tennessee, you're going to go across the bridge, and you're going to see multiple signs along this bridge, including multiple signs as you enter into the city that proudly declare the home of the king, Elvis Presley. In fact, if you continue to travel through Memphis and you go to Smyrna, Tennessee, you're going to find another sign that says the home of Vice President Al Gore. 
just south of Houston is a town by the name of Alvin, Texas. Does anybody know who famous or who was famous that came from Alvin, Texas? Nolan Ryan. Nolan Ryan, yes, sir. In fact, out of all the states and cities that were proudly displaying an individual's name on billboard, under lights, in public squares, in public arenas, I have to say, Alvin, Texas is probably the one that did it the biggest. I'm telling you, there's not a street in Alvin, Texas that I went down that doesn't have something to do with the great pitcher, Nolan Ryan. In fact, they have a large museum dedicated to reserving the entire history of Nolan Ryan. Interesting. This is very common as we, tra as we would travel in cities and states from East Coast to West Coast. I began to somewhat enjoy looking for an individual that was famous from that certain area and look for their sign that would appear. I mean, just really, it's kind of strange, but nonetheless, we as individuals... We seem to, we're seem to be drawn and attracted to proudly displaying individual, individuals that have come for, from our certain arena or circle. Whether it's from our church or job or family or city or state, we somewhat as a people desire to display our relationship in some sort of way to one that has achieved success, that has come from a certain realm of circle. You know, just a side note, when we get saved and we come out of our family and we go about to do our own thing, so to speak, and we try to return to our family, our circle of friends, those individuals that we may have grown up with as Christians, they sometimes don't receive us the same way Jesus was not received. Right. Yeah. You know, we are, so many times we are rejected by the people that are closest to us. We'll find in our text, as we have just read, that Jesus Christ was rejected by those who knew him best. My point is, if we're not careful, we can miss out on so much because we have limited our vision or limited the momentum in which God is trying to work in our life. Thus the title for the sermon, Take Your Foot or Take Your Feet Off the Brakes. There are many individuals that have grown to some state or status of success or some uh, some way of achieving success, whether it's through sports or political field or, or the church realm. And it's those individuals that they grew up around that don't receive them. Now you understand exactly why Jesus says in verse 4, But Jesus saith unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and his own house. In fact, this verse of Scripture right here helped me in the military to understand why when you get promoted to a certain rank, they take you from the group of men that you ran around with or that you served with, and they put you with a whole different group of people. Why? Because those same group of people, they know you best. And they don't see you no longer as... Corporal or sergeant or staff sergeant, so and so. No, they still see you as buddy, as friend. They don't see you as authority. Here we have Jesus, the same very people he grew up with in the city of Nazareth. In verse 1, it says, He came unto his own country in the city of Nazareth. These same people. Didn't receive him. They put on the brakes, so to speak. They were in a fashion of holding down the brakes 
which enabled Well, instead of enabled, it didn't enable Christ. It disabled his ability to do things Amen. in their life or in their individual life or in their city. You know, you might be here and you might say that that's impossible. But our passage of Scripture shows us that a town, an entire group of people, missed out on something extraordinary. Because they put on the brakes. Look in verse 5. And he could there do no mighty work. We have here in, the, in this portion of scripture demonstrated some great things. The power and the presence and the plan of God is all right here. Yet the Bible tells us Jesus Christ could do no great work works except heal a couple of people. I don't know about you, but that it, it just consumes me. It, it makes me want to take this as a warning. I firmly believe in learning from other people's mistakes. Amen. And we can learn something here that can help us individually, that can help us as husbands to our wives and fathers to our children and wives to our husband and, and, and our mothers to our children as a church collectively. We can take and learn from the city of Nazareth a few warning signs or learn from their mistakes. You know, his hometown was Nazareth. And in fact, the word Nazareth means the despised city. In modern words, if we were to define Nazareth, so to speak, we might refer to it as the slums or as the ghetto. Actually, Unger's Bible Dictionary describes Nazareth as a location on the most southern part of the range of the lower Galilee mountains. You couldn't see anything outside of the city. It was in a basin. It was like in a bowl. Now, if you were to go to the tip of the, the basin or the bowl or the valley or the hills of the ranges there in the city of the, the realm of Galilee, you could see great. In fact, Hunger's Bible Dictionary says you could see up to about 60 miles and you could see many historic places recorded in the Bible. But there in the despised city... You wouldn't be able to see anything. It's an isolated location. It's a place of low cultural standards. It's a place of rude dialect. A place of low education or low social standards. It's the lowest part of the society there. And this is where... The parents of Jesus Christ raised the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In fact, this is the same city that the angel came and announced the birth of Jesus Christ, Nazareth. This is the same city that as a boy, use your imagination with me, Jesus Christ would run around and play and enjoy being a boy enjoy growing up and learning as a carpenter, enjoy sitting at the feet of his mom and dad and hearing wonderful stories of how God worked miraculously in their life, this would be the same city that Jesus would grow up unto manhood. You know, in verse 1, it tells us that he went back to his home country. And I'm not quite certain exactly what his reasons or what his desires was when he got to his own country, the city of Nazareth. But I assure you, it was something great. What Jesus had in store as he walked down the side of the, the, the mountain, the ridges there into the city of Nazareth, no doubt, I believe, he was expecting some type of warm welcoming. He was expecting to be received in some type of fashion other than what he was received. Other than the way the individuals that he may have rolled up with received him. 
I think he had something amazingly in store for him. You know, I wonder exactly what was his intentions, what was his desire, because it says, look in verse 5 again, and he could do, and he could there do no mighty works. That really screams off the pages that his intention was to do something mighty, something amazing, something to be maybe a, a joyful display of his appreciation for all that had gone on through his youth and through his life as a boy growing up there. But when he showed up, the individuals were blinded by their similarities. They were blinded by the fact that this is the son of Car the, the carpenter Joseph. This is the son of Mary. We know his brothers and sisters. We remember him growing up. We remember the many things that he did. And they were isolated on the simplicity of his humanity and their likenesses to the Son of God. Folks, no doubt the Bible tells us that God was a man and that that man was God. But we've got to come to this place where we understand his humanity, but we also look past his humanity into his divinity. You might say that Jesus could have done and given and performed the mighty works that he wanted to. And I disagree. I disagree. He was limited in his ability to do mighty works because their feet were on the brakes. Verse 5 tells us that his desire was to do something great. What that is, I don't know. Take that just for a minute. Take it out of the city of Nazareth and put it in our own laps. Jesus Christ wants to do something mighty and Amen. wonderful in our lives. <clears throat> but we've got our feet on the brakes. We are limiting the Son of God in our individual lives. We are limiting the Son of God in our collective lives. Let's hang out there just for a second. Before you label me as a, a heretic, read the Bible in verse Man. 5. He could there do no mighty works. His intentions was to do something great. His intentions was to go there and perform and to display the greatness and the glory of God. And the city of Nazareth limited him. We limit him. You have here the presence of God. He went to his hometown. You have the power of God. In, in verse 43 of chapter uh, 5, it tells us, He charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. What is this talking about? It was talking about an amazing miracle where Jesus Christ rose a little girl from the dead. And he comes home, comes to his home folks, his own hometown, and the best they allow him to do is perform a couple simple miracles. They're not simple in my hands, but I think God intended to do something amazing there. He went with a plan and an intention that is not recorded here. There could be a whole other chapter written, possibly, if when he showed up, they weren't in a state of reserve. They weren't in a state of apprehensiveness. They weren't in a state or a state of mind of holding their foot on the brakes. Many children of God are glad to turn over the steering wheel so to speak. They're glad to get saved. They're glad to trust on Jesus Christ. But Christ demands us to move past trusting on Him, but to daily trust 
in him. The Bible tells us that he marveled because of their unbelief. They were holding the brakes down. You have the presence and the power and the plan of God right here in these six verses. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ was willing and able to do something great in his hometown, but when he showed up, his hometown folks were holding their feet on the brakes. It must be noted, it must be noted that unless we have the presence and power and plan of God working in our lives, nothing great will happen. Nothing great happens because Dustin does something or because Central Baptist Church does something, something or as we as individuals and collectively do something. No, something great happens when the presence and power and the plan of God is manifest through us and around us for His glory. Amen. It is impossible to see the mighty and great and wonderful works of God without His presence, without His power, and without His plan. Amen. We could come up with some great ideas, and no doubt they would work, but they would be no less than the simple healing of a few folks. This is exactly what our text is telling us, that he showed up, desiring to do something great, and the individuals there in his city had their foot on the brakes. Just a side note of humor, do you remember that the VA commercials, the VA juice commercials, and somehow they, they kind of cleverly <coughs> run out this commercial in which an individual finds themselves drinking a soda or drinking some other juice, and oh, all of a sudden they realize they could have had a V8, and you, you see the hand slap the guy in the forehead, the forehead, and out slips a hand and says, wow, you could have had a V8. These folks could have had a V8, but they settled for soda. Right. When Jesus showed up, he showed up, and, and please excuse my imagination, but he showed up with great power and his guns just ready to blare and his desire was to do something amazing. But they settled for soda. And I understand that's a poor illustration. I truly understand. That's the only one I can think of. But, folks, what I'm trying to relay from my heart is I don't want to miss something great from God. We, as individuals, we shouldn't just settle for second best. Right. We, as a church, we have no reason to expect nothing but the Son of God's A game. Jesus Christ has only got an A game. And when He comes, when He shows up, when His presence and power and plan in our lives is manifested, it's going to be something great. If we will just get out of the way and let God work and let God manifest himself. You know, in, in my mind, it's very humbling to be aware of the possibility that I, need number one, can hold my feet on the brakes and deter God from doing something great in my right. life. We can limit God. Not that God is limited in himself, but God is limited because of us. Jesus didn't show up that day any less of a man and any less of a God than he was in eternity past and eternity future. But there was one thing that hindered him. They had their feet on the brakes. This is the same God that Calm the storms. This is the same God that spoke light into existence. This is the same God that swung the stars in the sky, organized the water, organized the water system and the circulation of the air and the water currents. This is the same God that Peter testified, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the same God that out of his own mouth, 
He testified to being the Son of Man, the Son of God. In fact, when he was being questioned by Caiaphas, the high priest, and he was put on the spot, so to speak, he said, you shall see the Son of God, the angels descending upon the Son of God. It's not that there's a limit in God. God is limitless. God is all-powerful. The Lord Jesus Christ has all knowledge and all ability to display His presence and power and to manifest His plan in each one of our lives. We've just got to get our feet off the brakes. We just got to get out of the way and let Jesus work. His main focus and out of his own mouth, the reason for his coming was to seek and to save the lost. You say, Brother Dustin, I want you to pin down exactly what you thought Jesus came there to do. He came there to save folks, to forgive them of their sins, to regenerate their dead soul that is saturated in the wickedness of sin. He came there to perform and display the greatness of God, not because they deserved it, not because they were his home folks, not because he had some sort of special place in his heart for them, but the Bible over and over and over again tells us he has done it because his name's sake. He has done it because he's great. I understand by looking at many of your faces, this goes against everything that you have ever heard or maybe ever believed about Jesus Christ. I believe in the sovereignty of God. God's will is going to work out according to His plan and His desire, the sovereignty of God. But folks, we're missing two distinct things here. We're missing the perfect will of God and we're missing the permissive will of God. The perfect will of God we'll find in Romans 12. You don't have to turn there, but it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Our reasonable service is to serve God. And Jesus said, to serve God with your whole heart, mind, and soul, which is your reasonable service. And it goes on to say, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The perfect will of God in our life would be demonstrated through the great, wonderful works If this was going to be a, a portion of Scripture in chapter 6 that was going to share with us the perfect will of God, it would have had a little something different. It would have said something greater. But no, the city of Nazareth settled for the permissive will of God. You say, what does that mean? Well, God allowed or permitted. You know, the Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's perfect plan for every soul of man is that they would come to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. But because their choice to hold their foot on the brakes, they miss out on the perfect plan of God. That's right. Folks, just two things that you and I can learn from this. Just two things that we can work on that we can learn from, that we can... Two things that we as individuals are guilty of in limiting Christ working in our lives. We follow too close. Look at verse 1. It says, He went out from thence and came unto his own country, and his disciples followed him. That's an emphatic declaration. His disciples follow him. When Jesus Christ 
takes us out of the, the pit of despair or the city of ill repute like a city of Nazareth or out of our lifestyle of sin, when we get born again, we are called to follow Jesus Christ. Amen. But you know what so many people do? They sit there, they get saved, and they might walk with Christ for a little bit. I, I'm not necessarily desiring to go down that route, but then they go back to the place of despair. They go back to the city of Nazareth, the basin from which God pulled them out of. And the Bible says the latter man is worse than the first. We get saved, born again, God begins to work in our life, and great things begin to happen. The perfect will of God, the presence and power of God is beginning to be manifest in our lives and like a rubber band, we just shoot back to that sin, right. to that place of despair because we follow too close or too far away. Jesus' disciples will follow him. A follower of Christ is marked by Christ-like living. We've got to imitate the, the Son of God and our mercy and our forgiveness. We've got to have the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the desires of Christ, and allow them to be manifest. If you are a born-again child of God in here this evening, God is trying to work through you and use you for His namesake. Amen. And many of us are guilty and just sitting back and holding our feet on the brakes. Followers of Christ obey his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. Keep my commands. In 1 John 5, it tells us that these commands are not grievous. It's a joy to obey Christ. It's a joy to serve him. We fall too Amen. far away when we don't love our fellow Christians. We don't love our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't help and pray and, and be there to bear one another's burdens. Folks, we've got to take our feet off the brakes and allow God to use us. Amen. Allow Him to work in our lives. We can limit Christ by following too far away. It's absolutely a sad state. Turn with me to First, Second Peter. I've been feeding on this portion of Scripture probably for two years. And every time I get an opportunity to share it, for some reason, I hope you get what I have gotten out of it. Look with me in, in verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us, I know it's in the middle of the sentence, just, yeah, verse 3. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to <coughs> glory and virtue, the greatness of God be it manifest whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. There it is. Again, the greatness and the mightiness of God being demonstrate, demonstrated through us, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and besides this, giving all diligence add to your faith, Virtue, into virtue, knowledge, into knowledge, temperance, into temperance, into patience, into patience, godliness, into godliness, brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's my point. Look at this, verse 9. When we follow too far off, we cannot see Jesus. We cannot imitate Jesus because we cannot see Him. Jesus cannot perform His mighty works because we're living in this basin of despair. Verse 9, But he that lacketh these things is blind, 
cannot see, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he hath, was purged from his old sins. Folks, when we live too far away from following Christ, we're blind and we can't see. We limit God. Right. We hold our feet on the brakes. Jesus Christ wants to use us to build bridges in our in, relationship bridges in our lives with others for one purpose. To see people saved. Amen. To see people born again. To see people trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let that sink in. You can limit Jesus Christ when you follow too far away. Yep. We want things in our life and, and, and we want God to manifest His greatness in our lives and we want to see Jesus Christ, His hand of mercy and love and power in our life. But we don't want to follow Him close. We want Jesus Christ to work, but we want to hold our feet on the brakes, thus limiting, limiting Him to work. Number two, you can limit Jesus Christ when you partially understand Him. Partially understand Him. It's not enough that we have some knowledge of Him. It's not enough that the, the, the townsfolks of, of Nazareth knew that this was the carpenter's son, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simeon. It's not enough that we know that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. It's not enough that we understand that his humble entry into this world found himself in a manger, and he left this world through the death of the cross. That's great news. And I say that's not enough to a Christian. It's not enough that the only Bible verse in the entire Bible we have committed to memory is John 3.16. That's not enough, folks. Man. Because what you are doing, when you don't give yourself to study and prayer and faithful church attendance and faithful giving and faithful participa partic participation, your feet are on the brakes and you're limiting Christ working in our lives. It's not enough to partially understand him. They knew his humanity. We turn back to Mark 6, and we're just going to finish with these few last thoughts, and we'll be done. All they knew about Jesus was his humanity. And why do I say that? Look in verse 2. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, no doubt. If I could sit under any preacher, man, I'd love to hear Jesus just rip a hellfire and brimstone sermon and just go with it. Man. From whence, look what they say, from a couple questions, from whence hath this man these things? They're talking about his wisdom. They're talking about his strength. They're talking about his humanly ability to do things. And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? That even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Look, they have not seen anything. They're going by hearsay. They have never, they have never personally sought out to understand and know Jesus Christ. Folks, if all of the Bible you're getting is from the pulpit, you're partially understand you partially understand Jesus Christ Amen. if all you get is a, a, a sermon on Sunday and Sunday evening and Wednesday folks you're holding your feet on the brakes we've got to be faithful to dig into God's word on a basis Amen. when they said in verse 2 it says at, at the latter part and what it what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by him? They're not saying that because they've seen it with their eyes and they know it for themselves. They're saying it because they heard it. Because from chapters 1 through the end of verse 5, Jesus performed some great and mighty works. 
And many people go about to shed, shred, or share abroad his greatness, but they don't know it for himself. We must know him personally. We must know him intimately. Jesus was more than a carpenter. Jesus was one of a kind. He was the chosen Savior for his people or the chosen Messiah of God. There will be none like him there ever. He was one of a kind. Our highest priority in life as a child of God should be to know Jesus. You know, we say we know Jesus. We say we understand him. Is that knowledge that you profess to have, is that based off hearsay? Or have you seen God work in your life? Have you felt the presence of God in your own Bible study? Let me tell you why Bible study is so important. Most of us have children. Most of us have wives or husbands. How often do we spend time with our children and our spouses on a regular basis? Maybe every day. Absolutely. My point is this. How many out of those everyday encounters are amazing? I mean, every so often, I sit down with my daughter and my son and my children, and I mean, we just have one of those moments, you know? I take my wife out to supper, and we just have an amazing time. Once in a while, and we go out regularly. I see my wife every day. That's how your relationship with Christ is. You could spend every single day with him, but only every so often is his real, I mean, just swarm. And if you know what I'm talking about, you, you can relate, but only so often does he show up and manifest himself so real and so intimately and so personally to you. It don't happen all the time. It doesn't, it, for whatever reason. Maybe just hold our feet on the brakes. But Jesus Christ wants to do that. He wants to manifest himself in us, through us, to us, for his name's sake. We've got to take our feet off the brakes and follow Jesus closer as we enter this new year. We've got to take our feet off the brakes and allow Jesus to draw us closer. Amen. Because only when you are close to Jesus when you grow in your knowledge of Him. I'm going to steal a, a saying that preacher told me when I first met him. And this be it. We'll stand and pray and music leader come and musician to come. But preacher told me, he said, it's kind of a warning. And he'll, he'll probably remember this. We were working on his, his mother's bathroom and he said, Dustin, you're going to get to know me, and there are things you're not going to like about me. You're going to, I'm going to get to know you, and there's just going to be some things that I don't like about you. But he said, remember this, the more you know about Jesus Christ, the better it gets. Amen. Amen. The closer you get to him, the closer you walk in fellowship with him, the better it gets. Amen. I promise, folks, our apprehensiveness in taking our feet off the, the brakes of life <coughs> is just holding us up as individuals. It's limiting the power of God in our lives because God wants an amazing way to display himself for, display himself to us for his namesake. As we stand